Today we're going to talk about algorithms to find shortest paths in directed and weighted graphs. This is probably the most familiar graph problem of all, one that most of us solve every day. In this video, we are going to set up the problem and look at some general properties of shortest paths that are used by many different algorithms. Solving a shortest path problem in a directed and weighted graph is a problem that we solve all the time. This is what Google Maps is doing when it suggests driving directions to us for going from UTS to, for example, Taronga Zoo here. In this Google Maps picture, the length of the path is given both in terms of time and distance. This is the really nice thing about the abstract language of graphs. Edge weights can be distance, time, cost, for example, taking into account fuel costs and any tolls that you might have to pay. And we can use the same algorithm to find the shortest path with respect to any of these me measures. Note that Google Maps needs to model this problem by a directed graph because of the presence of one-way streets and potentially also varying traffic when traveling on a road in opposite directions. This is the setting that we're going to study today, finding shortest paths in a directed and weighted graph. Let's first look at an example. Say that we want to go from vertex 0 to vertex 3. There are several different paths we can take. We can go from vertex 0 to vertex 1 to vertex 2 to vertex 3. The length of this path is the sum of the edge weights on the edges in the path. So the length of this path is 1.5 plus 1 plus 0.5, which is 3. Here's another way we can go from vertex 0 to vertex 3. We can first go to vertex 5, then go to vertex 4, then go to vertex 3. The length of this path is 0.5 plus 0.5 plus 2, so the length of this path is also 3. We can also go from vertex 0 to vertex 5, up to vertex 1, then to vertex 2, and then to vertex 3. The weight of this path is 2.5. This is actually the shortest path from vertex 0 to vertex 3 in this graph. The sum of the weights of the edges on any other path from vertex 0 to vertex 3 is larger. Note that this path uses four edges, and the other paths we saw only use three edges. In a weighted graph, however, we care about the sum of the edge weights of the edges on the path, not the number of the edges on the path. We define the distance from vertex u to vertex v in the graph, denoted d of uv here, to be the length of a shortest path from u to v. So in this example, d of 0, 0,3 is 2.5. Also, to, in order to avoid a special case, when vertex v is not reachable from vertex u, we define the distance from u to v to be infinity. So for example, in this graph, there is no path from vertex 0 to vertex 6. So we say the distance from vertex 0 to vertex 6 is infinity. The specific shortest path problem we are going to look at is the single source distance problem. We are given a vertex v, and we want to find the distance from v to every other vertex in the graph. So when we have an n-vertex graph, the output to the single source distance problem is an array of size n holding the distance from the starting vertex to every other vertex in the graph. If we go back to our example on seven vertices and use vertex 0 as the starting vertex, then the output would look like this. We have an array called dis2 here, and the ith entry of this array has the distance from vertex 0 to vertex i. Usually, we don't just want to know the distance from a vertex v to another vertex w, but also a shortest path from v to w. You would probably be upset if Google Maps just told you that you can get to your destination in 15 minutes, but didn't tell you how to get there. You will commonly see this problem referred to as the single source shortest path problem. But we have to be a bit careful about how we define the output to the single source shortest path problem. From the name, you might think that in this problem we want to output the shortest path from the source vertex to every other vertex in the graph. 
But that's usually not what we want to do. This could take time proportional to n squared, which might be too slow. Instead, we define the output in the single source shortest path problem to be a data structure from which you can efficiently reconstruct a shortest path from the source vertex V to any other vertex reachable from V. Specifically, we can output an array of size n from which we can reconstruct a shortest path from V to any other vertex in the graph in time order of n. Let's look at an example to see how we can do this. In our example graph, the blue edges give a shortest path from vertex 0 to every other vertex reachable from 0. This is the analog of the shortest path tree that we saw was given by breadth first search in an unweighted and undirected graph. It's no longer a tree in this case as we have directed edges, but it is still like a tree in the sense that there is a unique path among the blue edges from vertex 0 to every vertex reachable from 0. The technical name for this directed version of a tree is an arborescence. You see in this example that every vertex has at most one incoming blue edge. We can represent these incoming edges by an array of size n, the number of vertices. We call this array edge2 here. So edge2 of i is the name of the vertex that the blue edge to i comes from or it's minus one if i has no incoming blue edge. So you see in this example that edge two of zero has value negative one because zero has no incoming blue edge. Edge two of six is also negative one. But edge two of three has the value two because the blue edge coming into vertex three originates from vertex two. We can use the edge2 array to reconstruct a shortest path from the source vertex 0 to any other vertex reachable from 0. For example, to find the shortest path from vertex 0 to vertex 3, we start at vertex 3, and then we look at edge2 of 3. This is vertex 2, so we know that there's an edge from vertex 2 to vertex 3. Then we look at edge2 of edge2 of 3 or in other words, edge two of two. And this is one. So we know that we can go from vertex one to vertex two. And then of course, from there, we can go to vertex three. So we keep working backwards in this fashion until we hit the source vertex zero. The edge two array has the property that this will give us a shortest path from vertex zero to vertex three. And you see that we can reconstruct this path in time proportional to the number of edges on the path. Okay, so this is the desired output in the single source shortest path problem. We want to output an edge two array that encodes shortest paths in the way we have just described from the source vertex to all vertices reachable from the source. You may be wondering at this point, why are we talking about the single source shortest path problem instead of just finding a shortest path between two vertices U and V? When we ask Google Maps for directions, we usually just want to know how to go from point A to point B, not from point A to everywhere else in the universe. The variant where we just want to find the shortest path from point A to point B is known as the single pair shortest path problem. The reason why we usually study the single source shortest path problem instead of the single pair shortest path problem is that we actually don't have any better algorithm for the single pair shortest path problem than for the single source shortest path problem. The reason gets into a key property of shortest paths. If we want to find the shortest path from V to W, we are naturally going to find lots of other shortest paths as well. This is because if the shortest path from V to W goes through vertex U, as in this picture here, then it must take a shortest path from V to U. If not, then we could come up with a shorter path to w by instead taking a shorter path from v to u. So even in the single pair shortest path problem, it is hard to see how we could avoid computing shortest paths to lots of other vertices as well, and just end up solving the single source shortest path problem. Before we get into shortest path algorithms, there's one special case that we need to discuss. 
I've taken our example graph here and changed the weight of the edge from vertex 3 to vertex 1 to be negative 2. You can see the weight in blue there. Usually we think of edge weights as representing positive quanti quantities like distance, time, or money, but graphs with negative weights can have interesting applications too. Now this graph has a cycle shown in blue here, where the sum of the edge weights along the cycle is negative. The sum of the edge weights on this cycle is negative 0.5. We call this a negative weight cycle. Now what is the shortest path from vertex 0 to vertex 3? Well, here's the path that we saw before, from vertex 0 to vertex 3 of length 2.5. But now we can take this edge of weight negative 2 back to vertex 1 to get a path to vertex 3 of shorter length. So now we're uh, going around this cycle once and going back to vertex 3. And this gives us a path from vertex 0 to vertex 3 of length 2.0, which is shorter than the original path of length 2.5. Remember that we let paths use vertices and edges more than once. We can keep repeating this process. We could go around the negative weight cycle twice, and this would give us a path from vertex 0 to vertex 3 of length 1.5. And we can keep repeating this further. So by going round and round the negative weight cycle, we get shorter and shorter paths. So in this case, we actually define the distance from vertex 0 to vertex 3 to be negative infinity. When a negative weight cycle is reachable from the source vertex, then every other vertex reachable from the source will be at distance negative infinity from the source. Obviously, the presence of negative weight cycles changes the game of finding shortest paths. We would like to be able to detect if there's a negative weight cycle reachable from the starting vertex and to output the cycle, if so. This is, can be done by the first shortest path algorithm we're going to look at, called the Bellman-Ford algorithm. I want to stress that negative weight cycles are not just a pathological case. They have interesting applications in and of themselves. As I talked about in week seven, an algorithm to find a negative weight cycle can be used to find arbitrage opportunities and markets, a cyclic series of transactions where, due to price discrepancies in different markets, you can end up with more of a stock or currency than you started with. We will mostly look at the case of graphs that do not have negative weight cycles. In this case, we can make some more basic observations about shortest paths. If no negative weight cycle is reachable from the source vertex, then without loss of generality, shortest paths from the source vertex will not contain cycles. If there is a path from vertex V to W that contains a non-negative weight cycle, then after removing this cycle, we will still have a path from V to W, and we will not have increased the length of the path. In this case, shortest paths will not repeat vertices. They will be what we call simple paths. In particular, the number of edges on any shortest path will be at most n minus 1 when the graph has n vertices. We're going to make use of this fact in the first shortest path algorithm we look at, the Bellman-Ford algorithm.